We're here to talk about you, Phoebe. Uh, we're here to talk about you and, and your wonderful channel of telling stories. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your channel? So I am a binary trans woman. And for those of you who don't know what a binary trans woman is, I identify as a female. I don't identify as male. I don't identify as any non-binary gender. Um, I exclusively identify as female and I was assigned male at birth. And I began my first transition when I was about 15 in 2004. So now I'm showing you how old I am. And then I detransitioned just before I went off to university. And then I very nearly got married. And then when that fell apart, I then decided to retransition at the age of 20. So it has been over 11 years that I have been living as Phoebe Rose. And it feels very weird for me to say that because I'm coming up to where I've lived more of my life as Phoebe than I did the person before. And when I look back at that, I go, if I hadn't done this, I wouldn't be A, the person I am today, and B, would I actually be here today? And that's not a sad thing to say, it's a realism thing to say, because I view the act of me transitioning as the one thing that kept me on this planet. Because rates of suicide amongst trans people are very high, and, and I was one of those people that did have some very dark times and very dark thoughts and I've been through a lot of things for a period when I was at law school I did what was known as going stealth so no one knew that I was trans and that was one of the most difficult periods of my life because I had to bury and I had to hide a part of me I had to suppress who I was for a period of it and it was one of those things that was always at the back of my head going well what if this gets out what if what if they find out? What if I get this, that, and the other? And 2015 UK was not a very welcoming place for trans people, especially when you're in the city of London. And for those of you who know the city of London, it's a very conservative, very corporate world. And it scared me sometimes. And it always made me slightly paranoid about well, what do I do? How do I interact with the people? Am I being clocked by somebody? And these little cues that you as a trans person, and if you are a trans person watching, may be able to identify and sympathize with me that, well, have they noticed this about me? Have they noticed this about me? Am I, am I presenting as passing enough? And I've definitely now moved away from that because it's very toxic for my own mental health doing that. And I appeared on a show that is run by one of the hosts of the non-profits, uh, Neil, 604 Atheist. And I went, it's a bloody good format you've got there. I had a word <laughs> with him. And I said, do you mind if I rip off your format? And he went, yeah, sure, that's fine. Just, you know, just don't do it on the same subject. I was like, yeah, all right. So I went on his show and then I started my very first interview with a wonderful medical student army friend of mine named as student Dr. Ben in July and it's gone from there and I love the interviews that I do I keep being told by everyone that I interview that I'm quite good at it I'm pretty sure Puck will say that I'm fairly good at it or else he wouldn't have wanted me to come and talk more about it I say I had a former host of this very show on as my last guest uh, one Leela Bianca was on and I try to find a diverse range of people to come on I don't want people who just look like me to talk to me about what it's like to be me because I won't learn anything and it's stale otherwise and mm -hmm. one of the things that I have found doing the show is that I've learned more about gender and more about myself than I have ever dreamed of learning and it's only by listening to the stories of others that I've actually been able to understand where other people come from because as a binary trans woman it can be very difficult for me to empathize and understand because I just don't understand what not being a binary trans woman is like 
just like I will never understand what being a cis person is like. I'll never get it. Yeah. And I, I, I sit there you. and I <laughs> <laughs> and I sit there with some of the interviews and I can get very emotional with some of the interviews because I'm learning a lot and I'm hearing stories. I say I did an interview with an older trans woman who lives in rural Minnesota in a town of 900 people. And that was a wonderfully eye-opening interview. And the more interviews I do, the more I learn about myself. And I hope that I can help educate the people who tune in to watch me on a Saturday or a Sunday when I have my show about trans people and non-cisgender people, because they don't all look like me, white binary trans women, or they don't all look like the opposite of me. White no, you know, it's binary funny trans you men. Should... It's funny that you mentioned Neil, because uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, I learned from consuming uh, his content is uh, that sure we might all uh, uh, fall under the umbrella of atheists, but there's so much else about us. We're we're so different, so many different ways that we have come to atheism, so many different uh, you know journeys uh, along the way that have brought us here. And I I suppose I hadn't put enough thought into the fact that uh, trans people must be the same way. There is no one. Uh, like you said, there's no one cookie cutter trans person. There's so many different stories and so many different kinds. And and I would guess that you're learning something new with every uh, with every oh, interview that you do. I learned so much from your interview, for example, when you came on the show. I learned an awful lot because when you said in the interview after I asked you the question, so what does gender mean to you? And you went, well, what the bloody hell's gender? <laughs> what is it? It made me. It stopped me because. I've always had a sense of internal gender. I've always had this sense that I feel some form of gender. And for someone to turn around to me and go, well, bloody hell's that? It's not that. I don't really give a monkeys. It threw me and I was like, well, okay then. And <laughs> that, it made me, no, definitely no, made me think. Definitely made me think. It definitely made me go, hang on a minute. Stop looking just through your own little worldview of you being a binary trans woman. Stop doing that. Well, before That's this so turns cool. into my story, yeah, can I take this? So I was just—I—I I didn't know that you were uh, sort of borrowing from Neil's concept, but now that you mention it, now that you think of it, there there is a lot of overlap with, you know, transitioning from being the raw the the gender that you feel inside to the gender that you feel outside and then also transitioning from a religious point of view to a non-religious point of view that's there is a lot of overlap with that show that's pretty cool um i actually got to meet neil a couple of months ago i don't know if you knew that phoebe but yeah well, we are both canadians it, it, it must be one of these things because canada is this enormous country right that has Nobody living there. I, I, well, there are some people living there who are living there, obviously. But it has a population density of, like, nothing. Oh, yeah. You all, you all yeah, kind of congregate around the U.S. border and around the coasts. Pretty much. Or where there's, yeah, or where there's water, you are, you, Canadians have congregated. So it's like you've got Ontario and Toronto, which has people, which is not far from Lake Michigan. And then you have people that live out mm. in Vancouver. And then some people live on the Atlantic coast, but not many. And then... A certain, a certain someone live... who possesses a mental vagina, I believe, lives out on the East Coast. But we're we're not acquainted at this time. But fortunately, Neil does live close enough to me that I was able to go say hello. Is it a mental vagina or is it more of a spiritual vagina that um, is being possessed? Well, I, f I feel like if a spirit, by definition, is disembodied, then whatever you feel in your mind would be your spiritual genitalia right don't wouldn't you think one would hope so i say for those of you who are wondering what on earth nate and i are all about there was a meme that was floating around the internet the twitterverse as we say that said that and this came from the anti-trans section of twitter that said specifically to trans women who have had lower SRS, GRS, like myself, that I could not be, quote, real as a woman because I have to word this quite carefully. <laughs> it is Thursday, so you don't have to mince words. <laughs> well, basically, I've had a reconstituted penis, 
was the aim of what they were saying. And that's not a real vagina. That's just an imitation vagina. That's not a spiritual vagina. That's not a mental vagina. That's just, uh, you know, mm. that's still a penis. It just looks different. It's funny how these people that want to appeal to biology seem to be completely unaware that the same cluster of cells that forms the clitoris also forms the penis. And it's just an influx of of hormones at the certain time that makes a male a male. Like, we're literally the same before that point. <laughs> like, you want to argue biology, maybe learn some fucking biology, guys. Like, so That reminds me of one of the interviews that I did uh, with student Dr. Ben. Is he's a medical student, and he was schooling me on, well, basically when a trans man or a trans mask person starts to take testosterone, there will be some engorgement and some enlargement of the clitoris. And one of the procedures, which is the metoidoplasty, is extending the clitoris and converting that into a, a penis. Right. And that is one of the things that fascinates me about what medical science can do and how these medical science deniers, so to speak, just can't get it into their head that medical science can do wonderful things. If it said a hundred years ago that you could take a heart from somebody and put that into somebody else and that that heart would keep working, they would have laughed at you like you were crazy. And yeah. it kind of feels the same with some of the arguments that you get because I had somebody say, but it can't be a real vagina that you've got. It can't be a real set of genitalia that you've got. You must have problems with it. And I turn around and say, well, I may still have my prostate, but this is wonderful to stimulate. I have retained all of the lubricating glands that I had when I still had it looking like a floppy thing with some bollocks hanging below it. And it works. It is a functioning <laughs> urination machine and sex machine. And it is one of the greatest 550,000 baht that I ever spent in my life. Oh my. It's like, it's like, you keep saying this word, vagina. I do not know that, I do not think you know what it means. <laughs> vagina. What is this vagina that you talk of? I see this person has vagina. I, you claim to have vagina, but you see man in Thailand who create vagina for you. Is this still vagina? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Puck can't even do the, yeah, the interview I, I, anymore. He's, I know he's, I'm he's losing lost. my composure from giggling here. Now, this is why you end up on every promo every week because you're you're you're. And then right? so to anybody also who is looking at Phoebe and listening to this us uh, talking about uh, her channel, uh, she has such a way of putting people at ease and doing a little bit of research and knowing the good questions to really make you think about yourself. Because going on that show and having to think about some of the stuff that was posed to me. Uh, she says I made her think. She made me think just as much. So uh, you can see just by you know the way she is now, just how uh, comfortable she's making us, and, and how how she has a nice way of making everybody at ease. Uh, but uh, don't take our word for it, Phoebe. What other success stories do you have? Uh, like maybe a couple of key interviews of. I'm thinking, were there people who don't really interact much with the atheist community or or online community that uh, you've been able to talk to and, and maybe help bring out a little bit? As I say. My show does not is not deterministic based on your religious affiliation. And I say I'm currently in discussions with a trans woman who is an ordained pastor in Georgia, who oh, I'm wow. hoping to get on at around about the end of this month, beginning of next month. Um, if you are a religious person, it doesn't matter to me, because I think one of the biggest disservices that is done by religion is that it can be very exclusionary to those who do not fit gender norms or have gender variations. And as somebody who used to be a religiously Jewish person, I had, who was a convert to Judaism, I had to select my branch of Judaism very carefully because some branches of Judaism would have rejected me purely and simply because I am a trans woman. And I try to get perspectives of people who aren't always like me, who don't just think like me, who don't look like me, who don't sound like me. And I try my best to break down the barriers because at the end of the day, my main goal is to ensure that not only am I learning, but that I'm putting stories out there that may not be going out 
in anywhere else. So I say one of my interviews that I've got coming up is a very good friend of mine who lives in New Zealand, and we're going to be talking about living with HIV as a trans person. And that's going to be the theme of the interview. And he's a trans man and he's HIV positive and he's given me permission to share that. But that's going to be what we're talking about, how having HIV as a trans person is different and how the system works and how it manifests. So I'm trying desperately hard to try to get as many different viewpoints as I can. But what I will say is one of my favorite interviews that I did is with someone called Amy Newman, because she was just as at ease as I can be. And she, at one point during towards the end of the interview, I said, so have you got anything that you'd like to say? And she said, well, actually, yes. I'd like to talk about my penis. I went, oh, okay then. So the floor is yours. And she went, well, the first time I had a threesome and I looked at the guy's penis, I realized it didn't look like mine. And she then proceeded to describe the anatomy of her penis, that it doesn't urinate in the way that you would expect it to. And she described in quite intimate details, the anatomy of her penis at the end of my show, in the end of my hmm. interview with her, which was something completely unexpected, but it was just one of those moments. It just felt right. And it was like, yeah, okay. Because not only do I try to get people who are trans on my show, but if you have another intersecting, such as if you're intersex as well, because Amy said that she was intersex as well, and we brought that up in the interview, and that's how she brought up the portion regarding the differences in the anatomical development of her penis. And that made me think as well, because I had never encountered somebody quite as open with their... Um, descriptions of their own genitalia and I'm just trying my absolute damnedest to make sure that the stories are out there and that the stories can be heard because I've got a story and lots of people who look like me have put their stories out there and lots of people who look completely opposite to me have put their stories out there but there's this whole section in the middle that I want to try to give a voice to. And I hope that with my show that I'm able to do that. And it's not just about trans people, despite the name. If you identify as a non cisgendered person, I'm happy to interview you. I'm happy to give you the microphone. I'm happy to sit down and have a chat with you. What if well, I'm just a really cool cis person? How about that? <laughs> I no? might develop some bizarre <laughs> side allies. <laughs> okay. Thing just to, keep you know, me posted. Awesome people like yourself on Nate. Well, just I'm finally, kidding, this first segment, you know, telling personal stories um, has to be really uncomfortable for some people. And obviously, if a person wants to keep something personal, it's it's their choice to do so. Uh, but what can we do to make people feel more comfortable in sharing with us? Do not push the person. They will share what they are comfortable sharing with you. But also, don't treat people like a Google or an encyclopedia or a 101. When you're asking a question to somebody, ask yourself this. Would I be comfortable if the person I'm about to ask this question to asked me the same question? So don't walk up to somebody and go, well, I've heard you're a trans person and I've heard you've been to Thailand. Could you please let me know what genitalia you've now got in your trousers? Would you, as a person, feel comfortable if somebody walked up to you and went, hello, I hear you went abroad. Could you tell me, do you still have the same genitalia that you went out there with that you've got now? <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. And, and I feel like that is true of really anyone. Like, you just, you don't go up to a woman and be like, oh, what's that, what size bra do you wear? You, you don't go up to a man and be like, are you like a, a five and a half incher or a seven and a half incher? I'm just, you're I'm just curious. Cause, yeah, because I, I see the gray sweatpants and I'm thinking you're maybe, yeah, like that's that's just not something anyone should do ever, um, regardless of, of how a person identifies. 